Acts 2:22 through 41. The King James text today reads, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, According to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Hallelujah. 
If you bow your heads with me one more time, Father, once again, God, we come before you today with hearts full of praise, gratitude, and thanksgiving. We come into this place today because we believe with all our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. We believe the scriptures which declare that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Master, I ask God today that you would touch your speaker, that you would allow me to be a blessing, a help, an encouragement, and some inspiration to the people of God, not just those in this room today, but to those watching by reason of the internet, those who will later watch and listen by reason of the internet. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost flow freely. Touch our hearing as we hear, that we might receive the word of God with gladness. And Lord, that we might allow it to change us, challenge us, lift us up to higher places in you than we have ever before known. We ask it all in that sacred, wonderful, saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. This is the gospel. We have so many today who have conflated the message of the gospel. Oh, they want to make us believe that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and that the gospel, the good news, the word gospel literally is translated. It means good news. And according to them, the good news is that we have access to heaven because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just so long as we afterwards can live a perfect sinless life. Just so long afterwards, after we have believed, we're able to be something that we're not. Just so long afterwards, we are able to change every single thing in our life that displeases God. And we're able to somehow become something that pleases Him in every single aspect. That's the good news according to many. Well, it doesn't sound like very good news to me. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about you, but I find it rather daunting that I'm told on one hand that God loves me so much that he went to these tremendous lengths to save me. But then when it's all said and done, so much of salvation then falls upon my shoulders once again. Amen. So much of that which is going to determine whether I make heaven or hell falls upon my shoulders and it's my responsibility. Where is the good news in that? I, I have a hard time seeing good news in that. But the question today is what in fact is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I've got news for you. It's not what Franklin Graham preaches. I'm telling you the truth today. It is not what Franklin Graham preaches. He may preach parts of it, but then he adds to or he subtracts from the message. And in so doing, he changes the good news into the not so good news. Amen. The Word of God declares today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first nine verses, the Apostle Paul is writing. And Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless 
ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, Cephas is Peter, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. What today then is the gospel? Well, Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel that I preached unto you which you received, and it's this message by which you stand. It is this message by which you are saved. If you do what? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. So he starts out saying, listen, it's kind of a little chain here. He starts out saying, here's the message I preached to you. This is the message wherein you stand. This is the message by which you're saved. He said, if you do what? Well, if you live right, glory to God. If you're perfect, hallelujah. If you're holy, hallelujah. He said, no, if you keep in memory what I preached. So the gospel is a message that must be embraced and believed. Hello now. The gospel is a message that we must embrace and we must believe. What is that gospel? What is this message? He said, for I delivered, verse 3, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. So first of all, not only did Jesus Christ die, not only did Jesus Christ rise again, but his death and his resurrection were both prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. Yes. So Paul said, this is not an issue of a man simply coming and dying, or a man dying and rising again. No, no, no. There's more to this gospel. There's more to this story. There's more to this good news. The good news is the Old Testament prophesied that it was going to go down this way. That it was going to happen this way. And guess what? It happened exactly as the scripture said. Amen. Hallelujah. What are the chances of that? You see, that kind of narrows the message down a little bit, Bill. Because the scriptures had prophesied this thousands of years before Jesus Christ came on the scene. What are the chances that all the prophecies found in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms, as Jesus said, which testified of him, what are the chances that all these prophecies would be fulfilled in this one man? What are, what are the chances? They're pretty slim. So the fact that everything that happened to Jesus Christ happened according to the scriptures is testimony to the reality of his purpose and coming. 
The fact that it happened exactly the way the scripture said is testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, that he did what he said he did, that he came to do what he said he came to do, and in the end that he accomplished those things. How do we know that he's risen from the dead? Because Paul said, because Peter saw him. He said, and at another place, over 500 people saw the Lord risen from the dead at the same time. There was a crowd of over 500, Johnny, who saw Jesus after he had risen from the dead. And Paul said, and many of these people have gone to sleep, meaning they died. He said, but the majority of them still live to this day. So there were well over... 12 witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord, or 11 if you take away uh, Judas. There were well over a dozen witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord. According to the Apostle Paul, there were over 500 people who had seen the Lord resurrected from the dead. My goodness, that changes the narrative a little bit, doesn't it? Yep. You wonder how how is it that the Christian church has been able to grow and to spread across the world. How is it that this message and this faith has been able to take the world by storm in the last 2,000 years? Because according to some people, it was just a fraud perpetrated upon the world by 12 men. Uh, problem is, there were more than 12 men who saw Jesus risen from the dead. There were far more than 12. That's why this message has been so powerful. That's why this message has been so effective. Because after Jesus rose from the dead, there were far more than merely 12 men who testified to his resurrection. Hallelujah. And it was all done according to the scriptures, according to the prophecy of God's word. What are the chances of that? Very slim. <laughs> Very slim that he would meet the criteria, that he would do all that the scriptures declared he would do, even riding into Jerusalem upon the foal, the colt of an ass. On what we call today Palm Sunday, the, the uh, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Even that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Even that was prophesied. And it came about exactly as God said it would come about. What is this gospel today? This is the gospel that Jesus Christ lived, died, rose again, hallelujah, according to the gospel. And if you want to stand, and if you want to be saved, this is what you must retain in your memory. This is what you must retain in your thinking. This is what you must retain in your faith. Amen. Amen. I don't care what Billy Graham's son preaches. This is the gospel in full. This is the complete gospel. You don't add to it and you don't take away from it. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, Jesus came and he preached, Believe on me and you will be saved. He that believeth on me shall in no wise be cast out. The message of the gospel is the message of faith. It is a message of belief. I'm going to tell you something. Straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. Whatever your life situation today, folks, the hardest part of the gospel for any human being is believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can sincerely, truthfully, genuinely embrace this truth by faith, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. The Word of God said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus 
and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Hallelujah! Yeah. That is the heart of the gospel! Got preachers out there and Christians out there trying to weed out who amongst the believing community is saved and who is not. First of all, that's not your job. Well, we believe in order to be saved, you got to wear your hair this way. you got to wear your dresses that way. You can't wear shorts. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't be this. You can't be that. Uh, I believe the gospel. Jesus Christ died and rose again according to the scriptures hallelujah I believe the gospel and while you may stand there and scream and holler all day that my faith will not translate into the resurrection of the righteous I'll put my faith in the gospel hallelujah I don't care what you preach I care about the message of the gospel and this is the gospel Jesus Christ died and rose again according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. Well, that's good news in and of itself. But how does it translate to me? How does the news that Jesus Christ lived and died and was resurrected from the grave, how does that translate to me? How does that affect me? How does that touch my life? How does my faith somehow cause that message to affect my life in some substantive way? If you think about it, Johnny, I can believe a lot of things. And that doesn't necessarily affect me one way or the other. <laughs> I, there are a lot of things in this world that I believe. But my belief in those things doesn't really change a, a, a thing in the universe as touching my life. Well, yeah, I believe that. But, okay, but what does it do for me? Somehow there had to be a way for each of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, there had to be a way for that message to somehow translate into a very real, substantive event in my life. How does that come about? On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the gospel. We were looking at our primary text today. We were looking at the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. The first day, the, the birthday of the Christian church. That's what we read this afternoon. He talked about the Lord's promise to David that he himself would sit upon the throne of God that, uh, excuse me, upon the throne of David, that God himself would sit upon the throne of David in the person of his Christ, meaning his promised one, his anointed one. Well, who was to be the anointed one, the promised one? The promised one, the anointed one, was not one that God would send from heaven, but rather was God himself come down from heaven. Hallelujah. God said to David, of a truth God hath sworn unto David, I will not turn from it. This is what David said. Of the fruit of thy body shall I sit in thy throne. So God told David of the fruit of your body, I myself am going to sit in your throne. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he refers to this passage. He said, men and brethren, 
Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, talking about David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that's an important phrase right there. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So God didn't say, I will sit on your throne, David, as a spirit, because the Bible tells us plainly God is a spirit. But he said, of the fruit of thy loins, according to the flesh, God said, I will sit on your throne. So what did God have to do in order to accomplish that? God had to take on flesh. <laughs> he had to take on a form. He had to take on a body. It, uh, the Apostle Paul said to his young apprentice Timothy, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. So God became the Christ. He became the promised one. He became the anointed one. And it is according to the flesh. It is according to that promise that God will sit in the throne of David. And, and uh, Peter refers to this promise during his message on the day of Pentecost. But having preached the good news of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God tells us in verse 37 of our primary text, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Who? The people in Jerusalem who had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, we hear the good news. I believe it. What do I do now? <laughs> How does this good news translate into my life? How does it affect my life? And in verse 38, then Peter said, and the rest of the apostles said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Johnny, some churches tell us, oh, but the gift of the Holy Ghost, that was only for the apostles, that was only for the early church. Peter continues, see, God never leaves anything unfinished. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, listen, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Woo, guess what? That includes you and me. Hallelujah. There is no end. Oh, this is good news. Hallelujah. Not only did Jesus Christ live, die, and rise again, but he did so so that I could be filled with his spirit. That's good news. You see, Jesus Christ didn't die and rise again so that we simply could believe he died and rose again. Now, you have to believe that in order to receive the promise. Right. But he didn't die and rise again simply so we could believe he died and rose again. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, he died and rose again for a reason. What was the reason? So that we could receive his spirit into our lives. So that God could pour himself into us. You see, without the Lord's having died and risen again, it would be impossible for us to then embrace this message by faith. And in doing so, purify our hearts, 
sanctify ourselves. What does sanctify mean? It means to set apart. It means to cleanse, to make ready for use. We cleanse and sanctify ourselves by believing the gospel. When we believe the gospel, the Lord says, okay, now, these people over here are different from these people over here. You see, there's only two classes of people, uh, Bill, in the entire world. There's what we call unbelievers, and there's what we call believers. Hello now. And God said, okay, those now who are classified as believers have sanctified themselves by reason of their belief, by reason of their faith. But what have they set themselves apart for? What have they cleaned themselves up for? What have they made themselves ready for? For the infilling of the Holy Ghost. God said, now, this group of people over here, I can pour myself into. I can use them. I can function in them. I can function through them. Their faith has set them apart so that I can use them. Hallelujah. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus promised the apostles, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, once you've received my spirit, you will be empowered so that I can use you. Hallelujah. I will be able to use you as a witness to what? To my life, my death, my resurrection. Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 11. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Listen. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did you notice that? Do you remember what I said a little while ago about after the flesh, Christ is God? After the flesh, you remember? We talked about that because David said, uh, God promised to David, of the fruit of thy loins will I sit in thy throne, and he was going to do it in the flesh, and therefore he revealed himself to humanity in the person of Jesus the Christ, right? right. Notice this. <coughs> Notice the language Paul uses. Now if any man have, excuse me, let me go back to verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If be that the Spirit of, what's the next word? Spirit of, verse 9, dwell in you, God. If the Spirit of God dwell in you. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. But look at this. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Are they two different spirits? No. The word of God said, for by one spirit are ye all baptized into one body. The spirit of God and the spirit of Christ are one and the same. Why? Because God and Christ are one and the same. Hallelujah. Do you get it? Do you follow? Glory to God. He said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What today is the gospel? This is the gospel. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again according to the scriptures. What does that mean to me? That means I can be filled with God's Spirit. That God can work through me. That God can work in me. That God can use me. But more importantly than this, that God can quicken me in the resurrection of the righteous. Amen. Because how does He quicken the dead? 
by his spirit that dwells in us. So if you're going to take part in the resurrection, there's a very important thing. You've got to have his spirit <laughs> because it's that spirit that quickens us. My goodness, that is good news, isn't it? Amen. Yes, it's good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again. Yes, it's good news and yes, I believe it. But how do I access the benefits of that belief? How do I access the benefits of of that faith. It's quite simple. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God went to these lengths for a purpose and for a reason. And that reason was so that we might receive His Spirit. Amen. Lastly this afternoon in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Paul writes and says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, see, this is where our faith is so important. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. So this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What today is the gospel? This is the gospel. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again from the grave according to the scriptures. He did this, why? So that we could be filled with with his spirit because as we're filled with his spirit we are able to be used by him we are able to be used of him and we are able to participate in the resurrection of the righteous hallelujah to God we have a hope of heaven why because Jesus lived he died and he rose again. Had he not done those things, then the infilling of the Holy Ghost would never have been possible. Sure. He had to first die and rise again so that we could be filled with the Holy Ghost. What is baptism? Because don't forget part of Peter's message on the day of, of Pentecost was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What is baptism? Baptism is a physical act or what is often referred to as uh, a ordinance. It is an ordinance by which we participate physically in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is an act. Water actually serves in, in the ordinance of baptism. Water serves to represent the ground. That's what the water is actually representing. It's not, it's not meant to represent water. It's meant to represent the earth, the ground. But we are buried. Obviously, we couldn't bury you in earth and then dig you up because you might suffocate by the time we bury you and dig you back up again. So the Lord established water baptism as a symbolic act in which we participate in the death burial under the water, and resurrection when we come back up. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You see, this is why we use baptism in response to our faith. 
in the gospel. This is why baptism in Jesus' name is so important because that is how we say, yes, I believe it. Hallelujah. I believe it. I believe this message. I'm willing, not only do I believe it, I'm willing to get in the water and participate in an ordinance that shows me dying with Christ and rising again with Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And then I'm in a place to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because God's Spirit wants to occupy my life so that He can use me. God wants to show this world that He's real. He showed the world He was real when Jesus was walking the earth, didn't He? What did, how did Peter begin his message on the day of Pentecost? He said, Jesus Christ, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Jesus said, greater works than these shall they do that come after me. He said that those that come after me, those who believe on me are going to do greater things than the things I'm doing. The word of God said in the book of Mark, uh, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. The Word of God tells us in the book of Acts, God working with the early church, confirming their word with signs following. Hallelujah. Why does God want to fill us with His Spirit? So that He can continue through us to minister as Jesus ministered when He was here. The only difference is instead of there being one Jesus in a world full of people, there will be millions of Christ-like people. You know what Christ-like translates to? The word Christian. That's what the word Christian. Christian doesn't mean a follower of Christ. Christian doesn't mean one who believes on Christ. Christian does not mean someone who follows the teachings of Christ. No, Christian means someone who looks and acts like Christ. How many true Christians are there in the world today? <laughs> How many call themselves Christians, but they don't live the Christian life. Because the Christian life is not marked by adherence to teachings. The Christian life is marked by a likeness to Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, this is the gospel today. Jesus lived. He died. He rose again according to the scriptures. If I believe this gospel, I will obey the gospel. How do I obey it? I repent. I'm baptized in Jesus' name. I receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I then have a hope of heaven. I then am in, and am a place in my life where God can use me in powerful, wonderful ways. But I remind you today, whether you're a straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind believer, the Word of God declares if... We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. You see, you can't just say you believe it. you got to believe it down here. That's right. Thou shalt be saved. LGBT believer, don't you think for one minute you cannot be saved? Don't you think for one minute this is the gospel? Hallelujah. Right. Do you believe that today? Absolutely. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.